Ko Susie Gould ho he kaimahi moa Grow Waitaha, which is a consortium of a number of agencies. Tatai Ahuro is uh, the company that I am from. I will pass over to my colleague who's here to share with us also today for a quick intro. Very nice to see some familiar faces and uh, some new faces and some names that I assume have faces attached. Uh, it's, yeah, I, I'm really. I, don't, I would say excited about this co-papa, but without sounding geeky, I don't know if it's that's possible. I'm really excited about the human side of this co-papa. Um, I think AI can be massively impactful and can contribute to equity and can contribute to the the deeper thinking and the rich learning and education that we're all aiming for. Uh, but that's not going to happen by accident. Um, and so I'm really excited about connecting more with you all and keeping this conversation going so that we can be really intentional about this inevitable shift. So, um, yeah, so that's why I'm here. And uh, hi, I'm Stephen McConaughey, part of Grow Ata, and uh, love working along with Susie and Nikki. So, um, yeah, that's us. Welcome. So we will be um, talking a little bit about AI responsibility um, ethics, trying to have this conversation or point us to some resources that will guide effective use. Also looking at frameworks that focus on learning and intentional acts of teaching with students. We've got a number of comments uh, that have been heard in the past about how technology has changed and some of the impacts that it may have at the current space. So you'll hear a lot of dialogue about it's going to end the world. It won't be as we know it, but I, I don't think we're going up in a puff of smoke yet. And children, even though we have a processing program, we're still valuing um, teaching spelling and research skills and how to tell whether information is real or um, critically reflect on what we are being fed by systems. So we want to give you a chance to talk to, I know many of you may have already, and to share Grow Waitaha's free resource um, that is around crafting prompts. I spoke with the very first person in the room today about being an IT advisor back in the day with Jay Foster and remembering teaching people how to put together a really good search string to get to find relevant information on the internet. And I guess this is the number one place to start really. How do you request and find relevant information on um, using chat GPT. So what I want you to do either in your head or on a piece of paper is to write a poem that's six lines long about your name. My name is, and I like. Now we asked you to sign up if you didn't already to chat GPT. So what I would like you to do is to use the same prompt that I gave you to write using your own intelligence, a poem using your name about the things that you like, and just pop that, pop that um, in as a prompt to your chat GPT. While you're creating your own poem, <coughs> let me share what I wrote and what my artificial intelligence told me. My name's Susie and I like tutoring with tech and hanging with people who keep it real. But I hate it when tech tools rob us of living in the moment or make us more vulnerable. And here, uh, my I didn't use chat GPT today, but I've used Claude something that I've paid for um, just because I can use Claude, Claude Sonnet, Claude Opus, and it has different writing levels in there 
for what it produces. That said, my name is Susie, sparkling bright, I fear. I like the sunshine, flowers in sight, dancing and laughter brings me glee. But I hate rumours, dishonesty, kindness and joy make my heart sing. Spreading love's wings as a beautiful thing. So opinions, type in the chat about the the poem, any thoughts, any any comments to the two of them as you're doing that. For me, um, you have got a little bit of the essence and some true story from the poem that I wrote. You have got very little. It's said eloquently, beautifully, far more poetically than me, but it isn't providing with the essence of who Susie is. So that's one thing that um, we need to keep in mind what our point is and our purpose of writing, that we are the ones in control. What I want you to do now is to grab um, the resource that we shared with you that has several prompts. If you didn't get a chance and you've skidded in and you haven't printed out, out any of those prompts from our guide, try these at the bottom. Try putting your poem in. Um, ask it to write a humorous poem about you for a five-year-old from a futuristic perspective that is colourful and intriguing. So we wanted to share with you the significance of um, some top tips for writing prompts in chat GPT. Prompts are critical and they change the output that you will get from artificial intelligence using, as you can see here, different tones, whether you're asking for something formal, informal, looking at multiple cultural perspectives to write from a viewpoint. We've chosen a futuristic perspective here. Um, setting the tone, the style, even the audience. Excuse me. Making it suitable for students at various grade levels. This has been a real buzz for many teachers as they can personalize the learning journeys. One teaching plan will allow them to be uh, to populate it at different levels. It takes quite a bit of experimenting and iterating. If you're not getting the desired response that you want from that prompt, you can mention um, your knowledge or background. For example, if you've got a specific level of expertise from a scientific scientist's viewpoint, you can add that in there. Um, you can uh, use complete sentences, so write those prompts in a way that makes sense on their own, um, full sentences, and give the context that you want to receive the information in. So just a little bit of refining our use of these large language models. Anything else that you want to share in there about um, prompts and the ways that we input information to get, you know, I remember they used to say, uh, garbage in, garbage out. Well, what are you trying to refine? So, um, there are all sorts of prompt libraries that you can go to uh, that will help you and your students. Uh, lesson planners, um, for administrators, if you're writing media, if you want to explore licensing, here's Microsoft. Um, the top tips when you are chatting with these with these large language models is, as I said, you're the boss. You're responsible for your own work and keeping a critical eye on AI advice. Which, believe me, 
is not always sensible. They have a thing where they get kind of spun out on their own uh, intelligence and the prompts that are in there, and it's called an, uh, um, an AI hallucination. So they're spitting out complete nonsense, un untruths, and they have um, even had some of the open source pull their AI script for the lang large language models because they could see the hallucinations were getting too great. It might seem conversational, but it, it didn't get me in the poem. It was making up beautiful garbage in a way. Uh, I Sometimes I use it professionally and I say, it said it really well. It says everything I was trying to say, but it says nothing. It, it's bland writing without the essence. Um, you can even, uh, you really need to be aware that the same question can get a different answer. So these are some of the things that we need to um, be aware of, that we have to take control and be incredibly critical. You need to steer it back to the topic that you want it because sometimes it's going in circles. But more critically, don't share anything too personal. Um, our code of ethics and use in AI is, uh, what is the word to describe it? A work in progress, I think. Um, Australia, the government and education departments are offering guidelines, but not here yet. There are some guidelines, but not policies and procedures. Um, there are debates that are awry. So really, just don't put anything in. Um, because it will gobble it up and learn from it and it will no longer be owned by you. Um, I mentioned before I use Claude rather than ChatGPT because it's got different uh, styles and strengths in that drop-down mode that I can use. So do try different systems. And I know Nikki walked you through a number of various tools. So we've just captured those together and give you a range of things that you might like to have a tattoo around. Screen recorders, image um, modelers that create AI art, um, platforms that will develop uh, quizzes from your slide decks and all sorts. So encourage the tutu. And thanks to those that have put their cool tools with it in there in the chat for us. I'm going to pass over to Stephen, who's going to support us in having this conversation a little bit more around reimagining um, AI's use to foster critical thinking. Thanks, Susie. I want to unpack a bit about critical thinking, and I know as I look around um, in the in the group, there are people here that I follow, that I, um, I mean, I'm sure you all are amazing, but what I'm saying is there are people here that I know um, really, really proficient in this area and that I respect uh, their work and their experience and expertise. So do take this as just adding to the conversation uh, rather than here is the um, the definitive and exhaustive list of things to think about as a, as a conveying stuff. What we really want, is, and this is for all Grow Wataha work, but, um, but especially in this space, uh, um, with with Susie and Nikki, is for this community to become strong and outlive whatever funded support we can run like a webinar. So you know, it's it's not the case that one webinar is going to fix the education system, uh, but you don't need fixing anyway. You're all experienced professionals. So what we're hoping to do is get the conversation going, and uh, that you then look around and go, ah, oh, yes. Um, I'm Liz and I haven't connected with Frank yet. I'm going to do that. Or I'm Nick and I haven't connected with Michelle yet. So that's uh, that's part of it too. So the context that I really want to unpack here is about the, the critical thinking side. I think there are a lot of tendrils to this, a lot of connections across this is 
it has implications for obviously the the kind of learning design, the kind of lesson activity you might choose. It's going to affect how you use any given lesson that uh, learning activity. It's going to inform conversations about plagiarism and assessment validity. It's uh, you know it links to the SAMR model and Bloom's taxonomy and Solo taxonomy and all of the things. So really looking at depth of thinking and using that as the lens and the framework pretty much for all AI use. So when we're working with students, firstly, I'm sure you're familiar with Bloom's, but I just want to pull it back again because uh, the original Bloom's taxonomies, obviously, you know, there's a Bloom's revised taxonomy and the, even that some people are unhappy with. But the point is, use whatever framework or taxonomy works for you to really go deeper with the students. And so if you're using the AI in a way, I would just go back to the Bloom's one, um, Susie, that we're using the AI in a way that gets the students to uh, just pump out an essay or a, a summary or something. Um, we know in our normal pen and paper whiteboard context that that's not deep learning. We now know after a decade or two in the e-learning space that we wouldn't do that in e-learning anymore either, even though that was where, you know, obviously the whole sector moved through that space um, in kind of those late noughties to get our heads around it. But now we know, right, well, good e-learning and good digital practices is that deeper thinking as well. So now let's just go back to our roots of good pedagogy with when AI is on the table and people are freaking out about, um, you know, how do we avoid students just solving our low level closed question by putting it into AI, uh, you know, we know that actually the problem's probably more in the low-level closed question than it is in the choice of tool that students have available to them. <clears throat> so I just want to put that out there, that Bloom's verbs or whatever tool it is that you're wanting, looking for ways, how can we get the students to evaluate and analyze and create? Now, this might be here are, here's a um, an output that I, the teacher, have put into, uh, into ChatGPT or into Claude or, or whatever the tool is. Here is the output. I want you to analyze it. I want you to evaluate it. Here is one written by a human and one written by AI. I'm not going to tell you which is which. I want you to try and work through. Um, you know, here's something that is written in a written by AI. I want you to rewrite it in your own voice or in the in the voice or perspective of a character from this, uh, you know, text we're working through or or whatever it might be. So you're using AI intentionally, but you're using it in ways that drag the learning up and drag the thinking deeper, which is what you would have done anyway as good teaching practitioners. So I'm not telling you information that I think is going to be new to you. I'm just inviting you to reconnect AI practice with the good teaching practice that you and your colleagues already have. So moving on to the solo taxonomy, if you or any maths teachers in the room that, you know, very familiar with Solo. It's explicitly written into NCA and has been for um, a decade or so, uh, or two now. Um, and other curriculum areas, some of them are not familiar with it at all. In primary, some of them are not familiar with it at all. But the point is here with Solo Taxonomy, it's a, just another way of conceptualizing depth of thinking. So if you're not familiar with it, the Cliff Notes version is, each of those blocks, each of those rods is a, a thought. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a piece of understanding. Um, so we have unistructural thinking as the one rod, multi-structural thinking as several. They've got a few skills, they can do a few things, but they can't make those connections yet. And then as you go deeper, you start to be able to make the connections between the skills and the things that you're learning. And then the last one there is, is extend that out into more abstract stuff. So again, whatever framework works for you, whatever thing you're already familiar with or your colleagues are already familiar with, I'm just inviting you to take the, the AI practice deeper and how can you use it in ways that, um, that are getting your students critical, uh, critically thinking. Which brings me to the next thing, Susie. Uh, whatever you, tool you're using to for your everyday practice, your everyday teaching, le teaching and learning, which learning activities you select and, and how you're using them, we're also wanting students to be critically thinking about the way that AI works, as well as the actual learning objective for the day. So the way that it works is a couple of things we wanted to highlight. First, about bias. We know that um, 
you know, these were these were actual prompts I put in, and I was reasonably happy with the output that it gave me in terms of, um, you know, it, it, it covers the basis, some basis. But getting the students to understand, actually, when when you, I saw, and this is awful, and and it hurt me to see it, um, being involved in the equity space, in the education space, in the let's make society better space, um, just in the last fortnight, a, an image generator AI tool was asked to make an image of Mother Teresa fighting poverty. And I'm sure you can, uh, it is what you would fear it would be. It was Mother Teresa fighting um, African children. So those are the biases that we hate to say out loud and we hate to see, uh, but they're still there. It's not like, well, this is the history of AI and now it's better. You know, you put in, please make me an image of Mother Teresa fighting poverty. And it says, what is poverty? Oh, poverty is poor people. And what is poor people? African children. And that is still what the, the AI biases are. Uh, they're baked in. So we're, we're asking for a picture of a family. What's it going to give you? Heteronormative, 2.4 children, um, and the woman's in the kitchen. And I'm not stereotyping. I'm I'm literally describing some pictures that I have seen in the last couple of months of AI drawing a family. So getting your students to be critically thinking about bias and uh, what that means for their own work and why you know how they're going to have to filter and and moderate and modify the work the the output that they're getting. But also, what does it tell you about society? Uh, you know, we're training students up to become leaders and world changers. So what are you going to do about this when you get out of school and you start and you get a job in tech or you get a job and you go and work in nothing to do with tech, but your job might involve using AI and people around you haven't thought about this. So equipping the students to lead those conversations too, because we're not wanting them to be passive. So the first one, big context was bias and the second one being AI hallucinations, which Susie's already mentioned. So the concept of AI, uh, AI making stuff up. So, um, for example, when I was doing my thesis, I, with the blessing of my supervisor, had a play with, um, could uh, ChatGPT get me unstuck in a certain point? And, you know, what are some of the issues in this particular space that I, where should I be looking? I would do the work and it was all legit and there was no cheating or plagiarism. But just, you know, what are some of the issues? That I should be exploring and researching, and it gave me a gave me a little thing, and I said, okay, dig a bit deeper, and it unpacked some, and I started to get a bit suspicious, and I said, right now, cite your sources, and of course, the short version of that story is, this the uh, citations weren't real, um, three of the five weren't real at all; they didn't exist. Um, one of them were was cited wrong, like that wasn't that thing didn't exist, but actually, I I was able to find what it meant. But the fifth one was the most concerning, which was that paper did exist and it said the opposite of what ChatGPT had cited it for. So I can't remember the exact details, but it was something along the lines of this paper said that this is true. Actually, that paper said that is not true, um, but it, because it's just pulling out keywords and building sentences out of it, that's an AI hallucination that we need to be training our kids to, um, to spot and, and work around and be aware of. All of this can be, um, you know, a resource that can help with all of this is this, this finding good information document. So there's a link there. And when we give you the slides, then you'll be able to just click that. But it is also just on the Grow It Tahoe website. So this is not an AI resource. It's a resource for Kayako and for students about finding good information and critical thinking and media literacy, which includes AI literacy, just a, um, a, a portion of it. So... We need to be thinking about the depth of, of our students' thinking. We need to be using AI really intentionally in ways that take that deeper and also foster the critical thinking, especially around those two contexts of bias and, um, and the AI hallucinations. Got it. Um, the new oil, black gold, Texas tea, that is. In this era, we're talking about data and uh, it's having a huge impact on in, um, conversations, Indigenous peoples in particular. Stephen mentioned the inherent 
bias that is built into these large language learning machines. So I think that governance of AI, if you're wondering, as I've seen it in the chat, you know, how do I go about it? How do I keep things safe? Uh, where's the data going? Um, take care, take caution. Uh, speak first with your students about this as a tool or a threat and some of the um, ethics and the things we need to be aware of and how it is portraying our Indigenous peoples. We actually have a United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People that they have um, the right to maintain, protect and develop past, present and future manifestations of their cultures. As you saw on the image earlier created by AI, this is not necessarily how they would draw, carve or express through Hurako the look of Atua. So some of these rights and the ways that they maintain control, protect and develop their IP are really under threat. And that's why we need to explore and have these conversations with our akunga, not just launch into the use of these tools. While it's also a threat, it also offers some very real and significant opportunities. This is Barry Suter, Ngati Piro, from the East Coast. He is using AI tools to, um, to refine and generate some of those forgotten dialects from the coast, Tolaga Bay, Tokungaru Bay, those hapu um, had their own phrases, intonations, etc. And from using old scripts, he can put that back into AI and then re, uh, retrieve, I guess, reinvigorate these, um, these hapu languages. Something that he spoke to Aki Mahweka 20 years ago and would have taken uh, all of this time, $20 million to have done. However, um, something like that now with AI could take potentially a million dollars and be done in a year or two. Such are the advancements. <coughs> um, Broad as I mentioned, is one of my new PA AI friends. Uh, Claude is the tool of choice um, with my te reo journey. I'm using it to support me and providing personalised feedback. So not only does it correct it, it get, provides me with a breakdown and the main difference in the language that I used. It even encouraged me. It said, you were close, uh, but there's a small error. So you, uh, somebody in the chat, I believe it was Sarah, was talking about, you know, how do we look at authenticity and assessment and use? If we're exploring it as a way to give um, immediate feedback, like it has for me on my tutorial journey, then you can see there are a number of ideas um, and uses to sharpen those assessments. Um, we wanna, wanted to provide a little bit of space to curate some of the knowledge in the room and to share some of the resources that we have filtered that will answer some of our questions around how you have used it to manage your workload, um, how you've used it with learners, any guidelines, who you follow on podcasts. Uh, my most recent one was listening to, which was a prediction of mine, that maybe it's going to be the plumbers and the carpenters that will be way more highly paid than our lawyers and our accountants. So this podcast was talking about the um, 
loss of the professional uh, sector of roles and that those are the ones that generally have high power positions. People with power don't generally give it up easily. So there's some social kind of implications and things to watch there. I encourage you now to uh, either on your phone or to type in this tiny URL um, so that we can visit our Padlet together and just talk about some of the resources and open the floor to our um, knowledge sharing. So we've got a number of categories in here. Things that we think learners and their far know should know. Some of them in this brief 45 minutes we have shared with you. Some of the key resources, guidelines and policies that we know do exist um, from New Zealand, from um, Australia, from the OECD. Like I said, these are a work in progress. Yeah, Some just, examples. Oh, sorry, just before you move on from that, Susie. Um, we also want to um, spread the the gospel about that those policies as well. So if you or your colleagues aren't aware that there are policies, there are guidelines from MOE, there are guidelines from NCQA, about NCEA, you know, using AI in NCEA, uh, they do exist and they're not well known yet. So we really want to push that, especially we, we've we been having conversations with teachers where they're like, oh, I've put um, student assessments in for EASTL or something and I got reliable results and I've put, you know, someone else saying, well, I've put it in and, and got really unreliable results. The point is the ministry's very clear line is we should not be putting student assessment data into AI. So it's, it's useful to have conversations about how reliable could it be, uh, but the point is right now until um, until we come down on some you know I, th I think is it is it University of Auckland I think it is some there is an institution somewhere in New Zealand that has a locked in Microsoft secure version of AI that you know it is it, it does have all that data security stuff in place we don't have that for schools yet. And so especially using free versions, you know, if you're not paying, then you're the product. Um, we can't be putting student data in, but we can't be putting student work in either. And so we need to be spreading that message. Please, on our behalf um, and on behalf of the ministry, we're asking you and inviting you to share that with everybody you know as well, because that, that particular message has not gotten out yet. Sorry, Susie, please carry on. Uh, to invite you to share some of the resources, but more importantly, to take the mic. Um, and we've got, got a little bit of a, a no-hands rule up here, so I'm just going to invite some of our 18 participants, if we have a, a wait time, to just tell us um, why they've turned up today um, and share any processes that they've used um, to manage workload, to personalise learning. What are you doing? Anyone take the mic for us. Mm. Thanks, I'm happy Liz. to talk a little bit. Um, just from the, in terms of the privacy um, comment that I just put in there, I looked on, um, at the Privacy Commission um, information around um, the use of AI as an agency as well and included um, their guidelines in trying to develop our policy as well. So we've gone through a process of um, consulting with our Māori whānau um, at Avonside and uh, talked to them first of all about AI, the use of it, the potential use of it at school, um, the constraints and the risks associated with that, both from an Indigenous perspective as well as just mm. a general human perspective. Uh, and we're really lucky we have a, um, a Fano um, collective, um, so a group of parents who are interested in working with us on uh, sort of teasing out what looks like a relatively vague um, policy, um, very much a mixture of um, the school docs um, 
uh, optional policy on generative AI and its use, as well as um, what's just come out from the Otago University um, as their policy on the use of AI. It's really nice, um, really straightforward in right. terms of for teachers and for um, students. Um, and then uh, we're going to tease that out into policies and no, well, processes, if you like, that are teacher facing and student facing um, with assistance from our Māori whānau um, in what they would prefer to be the sorts of websites or apps or tools that are used if you are going to, you know, research or want um, content on tikanga or te reo or um, stuff on iwi, whatever. So they're going to help us with providing because they're not happy with um, the current large language models that are used, mostly the free ones. Um, I think the paid version of ChatGBT um, is getting a little better um, from one of our Māori whānau perspectives anyway. She's um, in the University of Canterbury space and think that she's testing it always um, and is you know, increasingly happy with what's in there um, on some levels. Um, but yeah, we're, that that's kind of some, another layer, if you like, of um, consultation, but also guidelines that we're looking at, trying to make sure we get everything right. Not that, you know, that's possible. Yeah, thanks so much, Liz. Uh, you talk of progress, not perfection. We can't wait to have these conversations. It was introduced in November 2022. It's moving at such speed. Um, so thank you for sharing that and the, the work that you are doing in that space. Anyone else um, share some ways that they've had a play, either within their own kind of ease the cognitive overload of a teacher? or having a tutu. Kia ora, Susie. Jackie here. Kia ora. Hey, Kia ora. good to hear from you. Kia ora. Yeah, nice to see you. Um, look, I've been researching probably like you and other facilitators across New Zealand since um, the sort of general use of AI came out a couple of years ago. Uh, I think one of the things that I have found is that a lot of different podcasts I listen to are referencing it. And Brene, uh, Brene Brown's um, podcast, mm -hmm. Dare to Lead, just had a, re a couple of really good podcasts. And one of the things that they talked about was making sure there was a human loop. And I think this is a really lovely phrase because, you know, as, as you and Stephen are indicating, you can ask AI for something and it can be absolutely like wrong, totally out of this world wrong. And because it's published and on the screen, people believe it. So I think that phrase of and what part of your curation have you got a human loop? I think that's really powerful and also puts us back in the conversation around the content that's being delivered. So I just wanted to add that little bit in. Kia ora. So good. So good. Thanks for your contribution. Anyone else? We want to thank you for joining us today. It was significant that we didn't just start picking up tools and having a tutu and releasing the beast into our education system. Um, otherwise, it does pose a threat. If we use these tools, um, it's not the tools that are evil, it is the ways that we use them. So keep listening to podcasts, keep attending, having your input, watching, playing, tutoring with the tool and developing that human loop. Thanks for your input today. Um, that is all from me now, other than to give you the logistics of, if your name has been registered, you will receive the, both the recording and the Padlet link and the Grow Waitaha resources that we have to share with you. Stephen, any final words before we close with Karakia and close that loop for our session? Just to implore you all to stay connected with each other and with us. Um, and Susie wears a few hats and I wear a few hats and there's definitely some other AI links in there too. So um, 
let's let's keep the conversation going. And uh, I hope this has been useful. For some of you, it will have been new, all new content. For some of you, it will have been um, a refresher and just a reminder that there are others working too. And uh, you know, you're you're not alone. So let's let's keep these connections and relationships going.